Donald, Donald Trump is not, and this is what I was trying to say to Ross in this debate, he's not like some heart attack where the American system of government suddenly goes dead. Um, he, it, it, this is like gum disease. This is... <laughs> It, it's an infection, um, it smells terrible, and if untreated, it can work its way through the body, and then eventually, <laughs> dead. Uh. To the Harbor Wings excursion with the monster house. really saved my life. Thank you, it is wonderful to be here. Um, David and I were chatting backstage. I, the last time we actually appeared here together, it was to talk about a book of fiction. It, it was his novel called uh, Patriots. And it was a satirical comedy. It was a funny book that in its own way warned about the failures of the American political system and what may lie ahead. <laughs> that book was released in 2012, not that long ago. But I dare say that even in David's fertile imagination, we would not find the political situation we are here to consider tonight. <laughs> David's latest book, Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic, is his eighth book of nonfiction, and it is a compelling and important insight into not only what we are witnessing, but also what it might mean going forward. David, of course, as you know, is a, uh, is a, is a homegrown uh, uh, author, um, but he is also the senior editor at The Atlantic, among his many other t titles. Please welcome David Frum. So we are talking about the real world, and in, pre <laughs> in preparation for this, I was looking at other ocracies, bureaucracies, so-so, most people's minds, meritocracies, good, plutocracies, maybe not so good. What are the characteristics of a Trumpocracy? <laughs> well, first before... I have to say how grateful I am to see so many people here tonight and, and to be in this space. Um, this building and this institution have meant so much to me in my life. I distinguish between the building and the institution because I used to visit this institution when it was in another building on College Street West, um, which dates me. Um, <laughs> uh, but th this is, uh, it is a real place of, of memory for me. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here with, with, with so many of you, and thank you. Um, what a great... What, what a reminder of the intense civic spirit of the city of Toronto, and, and what a joy to be here. Um, uh, as you all know, uh, will remember, um, the word crassy comes from uh, the Greek word for power or rule. Um, that the project I set myself with this book was to step aside from the drama of the Trump personality, gripping, though that drama is, <laughs> and to understand how does he exercise power? You know, there, there are a lot of dysfunctional personalities in the world, but the whole point of modern governments is to build systems to keep them away from power, or if they somehow end up in power, to cushion the harm they can do, and those systems have failed. So uh, tr a Trumpocracy is a system of government that allows Donald Trump to exercise power. What went wrong because this was not supposed to happen? So you also argue, though, that the conditions for that to happen were there long before Donald Trump came along. So describe the ground that was fertile for Donald Trump in your view. So the United States, and maybe not just the United States, has, has been a, a political system falling downstairs since the end of the Cold War. The American presidency was built to wage the Cold War. The American political system was formed in the Cold War. A lot of the customs, if, you, if you've seen movies about the, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy calls in the leaders of the Republicans and Democrats from the, uh, the Senate and the House. That's not provided for anywhere in the Constitution. The President is supposed to talk to the committees of Congress. That was the normal mood, but normal move. But in the Cold War period, when you had to act faster, a lot of habits grew up. When the Cold War ended, America's place in the world suddenly became more contested, and the political system at home suddenly became a much more ruthless game. And so the book begins by describing step by step how the game got played more and more ruthlessly with the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, things that happened in the Clinton years, things that happened in uh, the Bush years, things that happened in the Obama years. I, I was a participant in some of these events. And you could see at each turn of the wheel, somebody would initiate something that had never been done before. And the opposite number would say, all right, when it's our term, we do it double. 
and then it's their turn, and they do indeed do it double, and then the wheel turns again, and the system is progressively breaking down. And against the background of all of this is that, and not just in the United States, but throughout the Western world, democratic systems are progressively failing to deliver benefits to more and more people, leaving people alienated and wondering, why does this system work? The, the, the democracy that was built after World War II, it did two important things. It both delivered, it protected people's rights and autonomy and liberty and equal, and equal participation in government in a way that had never been seen before in the history of the world, but it also delivered not only incredibly high but constantly rising material prosperity. And sometime around the year 2000, uh, that second promise stops being kept, not only in the United States but in Western Europe. And from that point, we begin to see the rise of these ever more radical alternatives, sometimes on the quote-unquote right, sometimes on the quote-unquote left. Um, increasingly, one wonders what those, at the extremes, what those terms mean. Um, I don't know if these names will mean anything to you, but they're the, at the big women's march on Saturday night in Washington. No, the, the, I know you would know that, 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 the next name I'm about to give. At that march, uh, there was a counter-programming event by a, a right-wing troll named Michael Cernovich. Some of you may recognize that name. One of the guests of honor at that event was Chelsea Manning. What are Chelsea Manning and Michael Cernovich doing at the same party? Well, that, that question times 100 describes a lot of the politics of the Western world. There's a lot of people like that are in the same place, alienated and susceptible to some shadowy forces. If those forces are at play, and we've watched them in Europe, and I know you've been to Hungary, we saw elements of it in the French election yeah. as well, and in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, why do you think it happened in the United States that Trump came to power? Um, look, part, some of this is just fluke, right? Mm -hmm. That if Hillary Clinton had won 80,000 or 100,000 fewer votes in California, and 80,000 or 100,000 votes more in the Midwest, Th this wouldn't even be an interesting conversation. In terms of the popular vote, Donald Trump did a little bit better than Michael Dukakis, a little bit worse than Mitt Romney, quite a bit worse than John Kerry, and a whole lot worse than Al Gore. Uh, none of those people became, I mean, and no one ever wonders, you know, why, what did it mean that Michael Dukakis got 46% of the vote? Uh, Trump got a little better, half a point more than Michael Dukakis, but the ball bounced his way. Now there are some the deep question there is, why did Hillary Clinton get as little of the vote as she did? Now, the two things that are supposed to, according to a political scientist, predict the outcome of a presidential election are the approval rating of the incumbent president and the state of the economy. Both of those, and Obama was, I think, at 53, 54 percent. Uh, the American economy was growing. Those would suggest that the party of the president, I mean, just call them brand X and brand Y, don't make it personal, that the party of the president should have won a third term. Um, Hillary Clinton underperformed Barack Obama's approval rating, and that is one of the big questions about the election. But what the real question for me is not did why, how did Hillary Clinton lose, but how did Donald Trump become the Republican nominee? That's the thing that is really weird. That's the thing that has to be explained. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you're posing your own questions here, but I also I want to <laughs> <laughs> I also want to um, um, tie in a little bit about what we've been watching just over the last few days in Washington. Yeah. And you make the point actually in your book. Um, and this is a quote, the worse Trump behaved, the more frantically congressional Republicans worked to pr protect him. Yes. So the question is why? Um, he's, they're hostages, in a way. They're, he's in a hostage-taking relationship with them. Um, that they, the Trumpocracy, the, the first and most obvious element of the system of power is that congressional Republicans have signed up for a set of politics that is very unpopular, could not win, um, the, the, what Paul Ryan wants to do can't win an election. Uh, Donald Trump somehow eked it out, and now he's in this relationship. With Donald Trump, all the things that a president is supposed to care about, he doesn't care about any of those things. Um, he doesn't know about them. They're not interesting to him. It's not that he's out of it or passive. He just doesn't have political ideas exactly. So he has this bargain with Paul Ryan where you have these bills that if Hillary Clinton were president, she wouldn't sign. But frankly, if Mitt Romney or George W. Bush were president, they wouldn't sign because they'd be worrying about getting reelected. Your platform is just too unpopular. Taking away Medicare from everyone who's now, or gradually doing it, from those now under 55, that's unpopular, and no first-term president would dare, and no second-term president would have the clout. So there was this opportunity. This guy shows up who doesn't care. He'll sign. 
But in return, he has a price. And his price from the congressional Republicans is impunity. Those investigations into my Russia dealings shut him down. Uh, my financial dealings, don't ask any questions. Don't let anybody ask any questions. You give me impunity, I'll give you signatures. And that's why he won? That's, that's why he thrives. He won, um, he, he won the Republican nomination because the rest of the party was talking about things that nobody cared about. They were re re recycling all of these ancient politics. Um, um, among white people who don't have a high school diploma, life expectancy in the United States is going down. They're living less long. That did not happen in the Great Depression. That did not happen in Germany in the Great Depression when people were literally starving. Um, it has never happened in peacetime in an advanced country that life expectancy goes down no matter how severe the economy. The only cases where it has are in the post-Soviet republics and in today's United States. Um, that, it, it's just a shattering fact. Um, and it reflects addiction, it reflects despair. That these people, the reason they are, that non-college whites are dying it's not because of some disease. They're dying what has been aptly called deaths of despair, drinking themselves to death, fooling around with guns and having terrible accidents, not wearing seat belts at you know, significant, significantly greater differentials as compared to other developed countries. Um, and those, and Paul, Paul Ryan and company were going to those people and saying, hope, growth, and opportunity, the best America is yet to come. And they would say, what are you talking about? You don't speak to me. And then Donald Trump appeared and they understood what he was talking about. Here, here's a measure um, that I cite in the book mm -hmm. and about how removed um, the prosperous parts of America are from these troubled parts. Um, in the year 2015, I did a, a compare, compare and contrast. In the year 2015, um, I went to the New York Times webpage and I entered uh, in their search box where you can see all the articles they had for the year, the word transgender. How many times did that come up? And I entered the word opioid. And no disrespect to anybody, these are important issues both, but op opioids have killed in the, past, in the past three years more people than died in the Vietnam, more Americans than died in the Vietnam War, and yet they got one-sixth the coverage in the New York Times of the transgender issue. Um, don't want to say that that's not important, but the biggest cause of you know, drug addiction death in American history, a, a thing bigger than, and it just, because if you lived where the New York Times readers lived, it wasn't happening. It was only happening when the New York Times readers didn't live. Given that, though, he was speaking to them. He was speaking to them. He, Donald Trump was talking about opioids in 2015. No other Republican was. He may be talking to them, but that same sort of um, disaffection, the cultural anxiety, yeah. the anger, he can talk, but the evidence is that the oh. Trumpocracy is not going to change any of that. Is, is that... He's a, I, sorry, I, I, I don't want to say this in any way like this is any kind of... Like, I, I'm not one of those who, well, you know, he's a carny barker, he's a con man, he's, he's deceiving these people. Um, uh, but demagogues don't become demagogues by talking about things people don't care about. Uh, you know, I, I, had, um, I had an experience during the Trump campaign, I knew some of these people. And at one point, one of the people I knew so reached out to me and said, look, David, um, you know, you've been fruitlessly with no audience for a decade talking about how the Republican Party needs to modernize, we need to accept uh, a broader health care coverage, we need to have a, a drug policy, um, you know, that open-door immigration is doing real damage to a lot of people, um, you know, we, uh, we have to have a more middle-class economic policy. The one candidate who's talking about the things you're talking about is Donald Trump. You should be supporting him, said my friend. And I said, the reason I was talking about things was because I was afraid of Donald Trump. I was afraid of him before I knew it was him. Um, I said, if we ignore these things, you'll get him. That, I, that, that it, it's not, he's the problem. Uh, many of you may know the joke, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, about the Plotkin diamond. Um, uh, the Plotkin diamond uh, is this legendary stone, and, and two women are admiring it, and the owner of the Plotkin diamond explains to the, her friend that the, the Plotkin diamond is this legendary diamond. Um, it's been worn by countesses, it's been worn by empresses, it's been worn by queens, it's been worn by the nieces of popes. Um, it's, pa it, <laughs> it's passed through song and story, it has acquired all of these legends, but like many legendary diamonds, the Plotkin diamond also comes with a terrible, terrible curse. And a friend says, a curse so romantic, what is the curse of the Plotkin diamond? And the answer is, Mr. Plotkin. <laughs> 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 and that's that's where you are. That's where I am. That's where you are. <laughs> um, 
there are uh, some uh, um, colleagues, and I guess Ross Dutat would be one of them, yeah. the conservative columnist in the New York Times, who says this is things are not as dire as perhaps you suggest. He's saying this is farce as opposed to tragedy. Right. Um, uh, that and others have argued that there are checks and balances in place in the American political system that you know will prevent you know the worst from happening. How do you answer that? Well, Ross and I, um, and it'll go up tonight, had a debate in the pages of the New York Times on one of their, I mean, one of the great things about the modern media world is you have like the sort of the New York Times you remember, and then you have all these adjunct New York Times where you can do things you could never do before. So we had a real live time debate, and then it is New York Times, so it gets, they eliminate all their typograph, many typographical errors, <laughs> cut some of the language, um, and, and you can see this debate. What, one of the things I've tried to stress about Donald Trump when I started writing about this, when Donald Trump was elected, uh, when he was inaugurated, there was a, a lot of panicky talk about how we are seeing here something that compares to the worst moments in history, January of 1933. So I have always believed that the train line of bad includes a lot of stops before you get to Hitler Station. And it's, it's, you're not on the express, you're on the local. And, and Donald, Donald Trump is not, and this is what I was trying to say to Ross in this debate, he's not like some heart attack where the American system of government suddenly goes <laughs> dead. Um, he, it, it, this is like gum disease. This is <laughs> <laughs> it, it's an infection. Um, it smells terrible. And if untreated, it can work its way through the body and then eventually <laughs> dead. Uh, but it takes a while. I hope Ross is right. Um, and the thing, and one of the reasons I wrote this book, so the, the biggest question I had about this book um, was, should I, when should I write it? Because I've been accumulating, I've been working on these subject matters really since 20, 2007, intensely since 2014, super intensely since Election Day. Um, and part of it was, I will admit, that I was getting frightened by the files and think, I will, if I wait much longer, I will not, I will not be able to remember my own research. Um, but there is a case for waiting until you know the end of the story mm -hmm. and explaining what happened and why. But there's also a case of acting, and this is the way I act, acting in time. I, I think a lot about this scenario. The, the biggest unfairness, systematic unfairness in judging our governors, our politicians, is that while politicians get uh, tremendous blame for things that go wrong and some credit for things that go right. They get no credit for bad things that don't happen. And yet that's the most important thing they do. And the, the way I sort of dramatize Didn't this. Didn't Trump just claim one of those, uh, the no, uh, uh, no air, air, no, no air airline disasters crashes. while right. he's been in office? No, no yeah. airline crashes. <laughs> he, uh, by the way, he uh, tweeted that just in his usual callous way, uh, the same weekend as 12 Americans died in a plane crash in Costa Rica. But it wasn't a regularly scheduled air flight, so apparently, good count. news for the loved ones of those 12 people, it didn't count. Um, that is, it could not have been more insensitive. It, but the analogy I use for this is, um, you know, in, in, I forget, 1997 or 98, the United States government con convened a panel on airline security under Vice President Gore. And they had a bunch of recommendations, many of them implemented. But one of, the implement one of the recommendations was to harden airplane cockpits against someone rushing the, ca the cabin. And the airline industry lobbied against that this was going to be very expensive and really it wasn't a real problem. And I imagine, what if some member of Congress, some backbencher, had said, right, that's going to be my issue, and had fought and fought and fought and beaten back the airline industry and got them to harden the airline cockpit, and they had done it just in time to avert 9-11 or prevent 9-11 from taking the form that it did. Instead, something else terrible happened instead of that. Would we honor that person? Or would we say, he's the guy who's always boring us about the airline hawk, hawk plot. Meanwhile, there was this whole other terrorist plot that, didn't ha that he never prevented because we would never have known what was behind Monty Hall's door number two. Uh, so uh, so I, I wrote this book with an effort to make sure that Ross's um, assurances are borne out. If we act now, um, I think a lot of the worst can be averted. Every day, things happen that are going to be very hard to turn around, and that is especially true internationally. Okay. I want to ask you about a couple of things that you yeah. touched on, so let's go to the international one. How you, you write quite a bit about Russia's involvement and the collusion between the Trump campaign and, and the Russian government. How extensive 
do you believe that collusion actually is? I don't want to get ahead of the, what we know. Um, what we know already is really, really disturbing. Here's the big thing we do not know. We do not know, or I do not know, or maybe somebody knows, but it's not in the public eye, um, how, much how much the Trump campaign communicated with the Russians. Did they tell them, here's, here's some data that you could use. What we would really appreciate is ABC. We don't know that any of that took place, but here's what we do know. Um, we do know that um, Russian agents hacked Democratic Party email. We know they also seem to have hacked at least some Republican emails. Um, we know, by the way, that they've hacked emails. I mean, they hacked um, emails throughout the day. For some reason, like, um, centrist politicians seem to have really terrible uh, internet security, and extremist politicians apparently have great emails because the, Ru <laughs> the Russians never get the extremist email. But, um, but they got some Republican and quite a lot of Democratic material. Uh, the Russians did that. That's not in serious dispute. Most of the time, Donald Trump doesn't even dispute that. Um, it was dumped. We know that. We, we know that there was an offer to, by, the, by not just WikiLeaks, but by the Russians to the Trump campaign to share this information. And Don Jr. had staged a meeting with um, the, the campaign manager there to hear what the Russians had to say, information that he knew was stolen. Um, we, we know uh, that the Russians placed a lot of ads, and every day we're learning more and more about what they did. It now looks like more people in 2016 saw a Russian ad than actually cast a vote. How influential those ads are, who can say? But uh, they did, they, the Russians did this. Um, and we have a, a pretty good idea that the Trump people had at least some advanced knowledge. I talk about this in the book. Mm -hmm. That w when WikiLeaks, they knew the approximate timing of when WikiLeaks dumps were coming. We don't know whether they knew what was in those dumps, and we don't know whether there was any coordination or discussion of what was in those dumps. But the, the last and most spectacular of the dumps, which happens on October 7th, about 45 minutes after the Access Hollywood tape, is reported by David Farenthold of the Washington Post. Um, a week before that dump, Roger Stone and others in the Trump campaign were online talking about this, this, this coming thing. And they thought it would happen on a Wednesday. In fact, with steely discipline, whoever was controlling it held it back to Friday and squash David Farenthold's Access Hollywood story. You call that the most successful foreign espionage attempt against the US in the nation's history. You also talk about the courts mm -hmm. um, and their involvement in the travel ban and, and basically trying to, I guess, ascertain the president's motive in some way. And you say that in order to save the constitutional system, its defenders are at the risk of corroding it. Right. I, I have a chapter in the book about what one of the real risks of Donald Trump is what I call autoimmune disorders. Um, that is, the system is responding to this alien presence by doing things in self-defense that are understandable but are dangerous. Let me give you one example. I think many of you will remember it. Uh, so Trump's first choice for national security advisor was a man named Michael Flynn, who was a paid agent of the Turkish government, and which he never disclosed, and with various improper relations with the Russians. Um, Michael Flynn told a series of stories about his relationships with the Russians, which were then proven to be untrue. Um, and he was fired for telling the lie. How was he caught? Well, the United States was listening to those conversations. Elements of the United States government were listening to those conversations. And whoever had access to those conversations leaked that information to the newspapers, giving the lie to Michael Flynn, forcing his resignation. Now, the Russian ambassador, no child, when he talked to Michael Flynn, was talking in a way that he believed was secure. He wouldn't have talked to him in a, if, if, in a way that the US intelligence could hear. Whoever had this information burned knowingly, because this is obviously somebody very inside, said it would, in order to prove that Michael Flynn is dangerous and to give the lie to what he said, we are going to betray a very important secret of the United States, that we are able to listen to this particular conversational line. And I have many more examples of these things. And this is something really, really to worry about. Um, one of the biggest worries, uh, the United States, Donald Trump, uh, the president every day gets something called the President's Daily Intelligence Brief. It's the, where the most precious secrets of the United States are gathered. The president gets it. Typically, not always, the vice president has access to it. The national security ad has ac advisor has access to it. The chief of staff has access to it. Um, Bill Clinton let Hillary Clinton have access to it. It made up for a lot of other things. Um, <laughs> 
but it's usually four, five super senior people with a real need to know these most precious secrets of the United States. In the Trump administration, the Washington Post reported the other day, 14 people are reading this thing, including Jared Kushner, the president's son, who's under all kinds of investigation. Now, you're the people writing that brief. Do you think very hard about what you put in it? Maybe you put the second best secrets of the United States in. I mean, if the president asks, you won't lie to him, um, but he never asks. He gets his information from Fox and Friends. And you might think, you know, it's, it's a waste of time anyway. The president's not reading it. Jared Kushner is. I don't work for Jared Kushner. Um, uh, and the, what you're seeing is a drift away of the intelligence and military from civilian control. Remember the movie of Seven Days in May? Uh, about these de uh, generals who want to go to war and this peace-loving president half based on Adlai Stevenson, half based on John F. Kennedy, and eventually he's going to do a detente with the Soviets in order to stop them. The military try to overthrow him. Okay, seven days in May only with the generals as the good guys. You have this belligerent president who wants to go to war in the Korean Peninsula because he doesn't care about the 400,000 Koreans who would lose their lives in such a thing, and the military badly doesn't want to go to war in the Korean Peninsula, and they just find ways to deprive the president of information, to disobey his orders. Now, this bureaucracies always want to escape political control. Um, it takes a lot of work to keep the military, which is the biggest bureaucracy of them all, under civilian control. This can become a habit. You, you call it, what it was the uncomfortable subordination? You, you, it's an uncomfortable subordination. Um, John Kelly, in his very strange press conference, talked about how he expressed this profound alienation. And he lost, John, John Kelly, the chief of staff, lost a son in Iraq. Just imagine how painful that is. But he lost a son in Iraq in a society in which fewer than 1% of people serve in the military. The vast majority of the people he serves cannot understand his loss. Um, and cannot understand um, what he meant by it, what, what it meant to him, and, and how he interprets and understands it. And he gave this very angry press conference. He had been caught in a conference. I won't waste your time with the details. Um, and he lashed out at the press because he lives in one world and they live in another. And the subordination of the military to the civilian society does get increasingly uncomfortable when so few serve. And, and Trump is basically now wiping that away. And, and Trump, by, uh, because of his infatuation with generals, he's got generals in places, there's a general who heads the prison service. He's got generals in places where nobody ever thought generals should go before. Um, they're the only people he defers to at all, shows any respect to. Um, and uh, they are appearing, I mean, there's, a chief, there's one of the chief of staff, there's a national security advisor. Um, they, they appear through the government in a way that, and I don't say this, I mean, they're terrific. I mean, generals, I mean, they, they, this, they are really um, amazing people who have done amazing things, and, and you should listen to them. But, you know, other kinds of experience are also useful for a president to hear. <laughs> and this president doesn't hear those. One of the most um, frightening sentences in the book to me was um, about democracy itself. And you say, if conservatives become convinced that they cannot win democratically, they will not abandon conservatism. That's fine. They will reject democracy. Right. How? Well, this is, um, in the long sweep of the past 150 years, where you've had democratic breakdown, um, France under Napoleon III, you know, uh, I mean, let's not look at the spectacular examples of the 1930s, but when democratic breakdown <laughs> happens, it typically happens because you're in a situation of economic stress or military defeat, and people who have more than their neighbors become frightened that their neighbors will use democratic methods to take things away from them. And so they, get, they look for modes of government that will protect what they have and prevent their neighbors from taking those things away. And, and that, is, that is a very classic story of democratic breakdown. In, and the United States, has lived this. This is what happened in the American South after Reconstruction, um, where the United States, the American Southern states, from the end of the Civil War until about 1876, a little later in some of the cases, had a multiracial democracy in which black people as well as white people voted, um, and in which very large numbers of both groups voted. And um, they built schools, uh, they built railways, they built canals, and they raised taxes. And what the movement to take votes away from the black population was driven by was not just racial animus. 
uh, although that was, of course, terribly important. It was also that this resentment of the way that these new legislatures were taxing and spending in this war-ravaged region. Um, so I, I, I think you can see some of that happening with the way, again, in, not in a spectacular way, but in, in a lot of the states since 2010, uh, it's just been made that much more difficult to vote. It's not like the right to vote is being annihilated. Um, it's just made a little bit more difficult. You know, one of the great questions uh, to go to the why did Hillary Clinton lose? Well, one way to answer that, there are many reasons why you lose, but one way to think about it is, well, black Americans, one of the most loyal of all Democratic constituencies, came out for her in surprisingly low numbers. You say, well, you know, compared to 2012 and 2008, maybe it's not surprising that black Americans came out in lower numbers for Hillary Clinton than they did for Barack Obama. They came out in lower numbers for her than they did for John Kerry. Now, that is surprising. Um, that if, if what has John Kerry got for black voters that Hillary Clinton doesn't have? And the answer is, it was just easier to vote for John Kerry. You didn't have to show ID. And, uh, and these ID laws have gone into place. And it's hard to fathom if you're sort of a, a library holder with a library card. But you know, a surprising number of Americans don't have driver's licenses. A surprising number of Americans don't have ID. And these ID laws are, also, are often written in the state of Texas what does not count as valid ID is a student ID from the state university system, which is a, I mean, these are, these are government bodies funded by the state. You know, the, the cards are made out of plastic with a picture on them. That's not ID to vote in Texas, but a carry permit for a firearm is a valid form of ID. And it's, there's no mystery what is going on there. You, though, end the book with a chapter called Hope. Yes. And after that litany of worries and concerns and facts, you're still an optimist. Well, I'm not an optimist by temperament. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but my, my, mo my life motto has always been think like a pessimist, act like an optimist. Um, and, but what I've seen, and I, I open it by quoting an email I got from a reader of my, the, my very first article on the subject, who said that my article had inspired him to age politically, to read more, and to stop shirking jury duty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I found this a very inspiring thought that, uh, you know, that, and you have seen this with these, with these women's marches, and the thing that has been so awe-inspiring to me about is not, is, the surprise is not that people come out to march or that, to express themselves. It's how perfectly orderly these marches are, um, how responsible they are, that these, that, one of the things that I worried a lot that Trump would do is try to goad his opponents and to create this division where he is America and they are outside. He represents the traditional values of the society. They burn the flag or carry Mexican flags or get arrested, throw garbage, break windows. And these movements are saying, these, these super orderly demonstrations, saying we are the society and you are the outsider. Um, I find that very inspiring. I find it inspiring too because uh, American politics, it has seemed to me, has been very frozen for 25 years. I mean, if I'd fallen asleep in 1990 and woken up in 2015, you know, it, when I went to sleep, China was a poor country. In 2015, it's the economy catching up to the United States. In 1990, there's no internet. In 1990, there, this health crisis has not struck non-college America. And there's so many ways that the world is different. Uh, but if I woke up and said, who's running for president? They would say, Bush and Clinton. <laughs> what are they talking about? Healthcare in Iraq. <laughs> um, that nothing, that the political system was frozen. And I think one of the things Donald Trump has done has led to an unfreezing of the political system um, in ways that are going to make that political system map better to the country. We're going to start talking about things we haven't talked about. Donald Trump did talk about things you know, in the Republican world. Um, he opened the trauma of Iraq. I mean, he lied about his own role in it. But he, uh, he started the process. Republicans have to face this. this is, you know, for my generation of Republicans, I was a big supporter of the Iraq War. This is something you have to sort of work through and make sense of and say, well, you know, what did we do wrong? What do we retain from this experience? That was never going to be talked about but for him. Um, the, the, he started talking about drugs when nobody else did. He's talking about immigration at a time when um, the society won't, won't face it. He opened these discussions and, and unfroze things. And he's forced... The, this outdated right and this outdated left to confront some inherited prejudices. It, when you and I last spoke, 
um, I think Julian Assange would probably have been a hero to many people in this hall. Um, I think now you see what he is and why he did what he did. Um, and you see that threats to democracy don't just take the form of tanks and rockets, uh, that you need those agents, that in the, in the modern age, a lot of those threats are gonna take place in, in the cyber realm. That's where conflict is going to be expressed. And the agencies of um, CIAs and FBIs and the CSISs and the NSAs, they're important. And the people who want to destroy those agencies, like the Julian Assanges, you know, they're not doing it because they believe in transparency. Um, Julian Assange is not, is not transparent with his own materials. They're doing it because they want to overthrow um, societies. And on, the, on the, my side of the spectrum, you know, I think one of the faults of conservatism was we tended to be, this can sometimes be a, a bit of a virtue, that we're, we're you know, we're sort of cavern, accepting of some of the petty unfairnesses of life, you know, that between men and women, between the rich and poor, between minorities and majorities. Um, so, you know, that's just life. Uh, there are a lot of unfairnesses. What Trump did was he took all of those petty cruelties and he turned them into one big cruelty. And he blew it up times a thousand and he forced you to look at it all the time. And when you had to look at it, you'd say, that's not a good thing to look at. And, and you know, I think, um, you know, with this, uh, uh, revolution that has erupted in, in the abuse of women in the entertainment industry and other places, that that's a little bit of a gift of Trump. I don't know that that would have happened if he weren't president. That opened, that uncorked something. And a lot of damage is going to be done, but I think more good is being done. And people are forced, you know, we living under this, I'm sorry, I've given things too long an answer, but living under this with the most visible and public person in the world, just someone who's cruel all the time, makes us remember why it's good to be kind. Thank you very much, David. Yeah.